Going ninety miles from Dublin town by men in the hedge block cell to help you understand a little light in the story now will tell. I'm on the blanket protest and my efforts will not fail. For I'm joined by men and women in the cash and arm jail. Oh, it all began one morning I was dragged to Castle Ray. And though it was three years ago, it seems like yesterday. For three days kicked and beaten, I then was forced to sign confessions that convicted me of deeds that were not mine. Also sentenced in a diplot court, my protest it began. I would not wear their prison garb, I was a blanket man. I'll not accept their status, nor be criminalized. That's the issue in Hedge Block. If they could only make us wear their lonesome prison gear. But prisoners of war is what we are, and that we will remain. For the blanket protest will not end till status we again. of young men in the hate flocks start a hunger strike. At the beginning, I didn't know, nor did anybody else here, unless they were much wiser than the rest of us, did any of us know the price we would pay for daring to stand up and demand what was our right. But let the British take note that we are back, and we are here knowing the price that we have paid, the lives that have been lost, the families that have been broken, but our spirit remains unbroken and we are here and we recognize the price that may have to be paid. This time it's all for good, but it's time to the day on the day. Well, they buy the life on the air, isn't it? The sales, they, they never had, they keep no fresh air, never had exercise or nothing. They are, they are practically dead. 
Vai lo rende? Questo è l'unico way, è l'unico way. Ma se si sente un server, tutto il mondo, si sente un club, si sente un club. Si sente un club. They're Republicans, they're soldiers. So they even say that war. And what do they do with their prisoners? They're prisoners of war, aren't they? They're not saying they're prisoners of war. So it is a war. I mean, his Irish have been tracked over all the days of her life, but we knew no better than that. It's this younger generation that has got up now that sees and knows and education and all has put them to this. Sure, they couldn't get a job and they couldn't get nothing. My son was terribly well educated. And all he could get was go and reach for the trial of the brick out in the building site. Which he would have no call to have done that if there had been any fairness at all. Of course, I've been visiting them this past four years. And every time you go up, you would always see that wee bit, it was always that wee bit worse. But what astonished me on Thursday was, when I put my hand on his shoulder after I was leaving him, I could only compare it to putting it on the edge of a knife. That was the only comparison that I could give it to him. So I think my son is in a terrible state of what was that. So I discussed him about this H block situation. And as he told me, Daddy, he says, Sir, I've been telling you all along that hell couldn't be as bad as what we're coming through. So I said, tell him, like, well, can you not ease it a little? No, he says, this is decided now, we have to go on with it, and there is no comeback. We'll go on to death. So I didn't advise him any more to come off it, nor nothing else. Very soup, cross us, yes. You can't walk in the road. Armored cars all over the place. They say it's not a war. We have uh, all these soldiers here, and armored cars here. It's very important to the prisoners and the people outside. Very important to get their political status, what they're entitled to. They're soldiers. The, the Germans gave the, the British Army, they had own others and everything else. They were able to play football, play games. But the, I think our people should get it. Our prisoners. This war. Is it normal to have uh -huh. troops pr uh, patrolling your streets, you know, armed with rifles? Is it normal for British troops to come to your door mm -hmm. at the early hours of the morning, getting everybody up out of bed to search your home? Is it normal for a man going to work to be stopped and frisked and ask all the details of his There's family? You know, is it normal to go in to, out to do your shopping and be stopped with your shopping basket and it asked to empty the contents out onto the footpath? Is it normal for your child coming from school to be asked to empty a satchel? Well, I, I can't. If this is a normal society, well, you know, the world's in a very bad state. If this is the way every country is run, 
You know, so as far as I'm concerned, it's not an, it's not a normal society to me, because on up to ten years ago we didn't have anything like this. So in no way is it normal, nor is it normal for nine out of every ten homes to have somebody in prison for a political offence. So I would say it's a sick society. It's not a normal society. It's a very sick society. And the thing that has it sick is the British presence here in Ireland. And the only way our society will ever be normal is when Brit pulls out lock, stock and barrel. Why, there's one man or woman in the presence. Any prison you care to mention <coughs> in the North or the South or in England, Scotland or Wales, any prison you care to mention where there's an Irish man in prison or an Irish woman, they'll never beat us because we intend. Now, we're asked a while ago there, will the people continue fighting until the troops are moved out? The answer to that is emphatically yes, but the point about that is too, we mightn't live to see it. We may not live to see it because the fighting's been on a long, long time. But the people, the upcoming generation, have saw so much injustice, have watched their fathers, brothers and sisters been trailed from their bed and their mothers. I was trailed from my bed a few months ago and taken and arrested. And as Lily says, for simply nothing, they didn't ask me a question. Just kept me sitting there for about an hour and a half. Six o'clock in the morning and released me. There's no way that the upcoming generation are going to discontinue this fight. The reason Britain decided to take the, politi the status away from these prisoners, not recognise them as political prisoners, was not because they weren't, they were non-political, because they are in for the same offences or alleged offences as the men were before 1976. Um, I think it was just becoming a great embarrassment to Britain, all these hundreds of men. Like, let's face it, there's only, of the nationalist area alone, there are only half a million people in the six counties, and out of that half a million people, there are 380, almost 400 men in the H-blocks. There are almost 40 women in our mad jail. And as well as that, there are quite a few hundred men held on remand, awaiting, tri awaiting trial. You know, and when you take that into consideration, you know, on a percentage basis, you know, it's a very, very big percentage of criminals to be in one the one place, you know. There are about 40,000 armed personnel on the six counties. This is including the UDR, the RUC and the British Army. Well, if you can call that a normal situation, I don't know. Can I thank the organizers for giving me the honor of speaking today? Because it is an honor to stand with the United People who have been refused their basic rights, both inside and outside of English prisons. We today, by our solidarity, have shown not only the British, but all the enemies of the Irish people this side of the water and that side of the water, that we will not be defeated. And while we've won the march today, the work does not stop. The British government have chosen the battlefield. We choose our tactics. Yeah! <laughs> On the way to the march today, a reporter Ask me where we should feel all I see, not the Hitchcock. And I said, we are the brilliant people. We are the people, and we will smite the blocks. No, I don't think a hunger strike can succeed um, in 
any circumstances, particularly the ones we got, such as present, such as the, the, the present one. I can imagine that a hunger strike in, um, in a situation in Poland, for example, where there is absolutely no legitimacy in the government, in the views of the mass of the population, a hunger strike there might have some success. Where the legitimacy of the civil government in the United Kingdom and in Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom is not in any sort of question at all. That is to say, the government is supported and the norms of civil government are supported by the overwhelming mass of the population, Catholic and Protestant, then the idea of a hunger strike is to hold a ransom, not the government, is to hold the ransom, the public. Exactly 11 years ago, the people of the six counties, the nationalist people that is, went out onto the streets demanding their basic civil rights, namely employment and proper housing. And for this, they were beaten off the streets. Many people were brutally beaten. The loyalist people saw this as something that was going to take whatever rights they had away from them. And in 1969, the loyalist people were led up the Falls Road in Belfast by the RUC and the B Specials. And as a result, nine people lost their lives that night, including a nine-year-old child who was in bed at the time. Then they brought the British Army onto the streets. They told us it was for our protection. Well, what were the nationalist people to do? They were under siege. They were burned out of their homes. Thousands of families were burned out. They were brought into church halls, into schools. They had no homes. They had lost everything, what little they had. What were they to do? Only defend themselves. And whenever the law, the Nicest people turned to defend themselves. What did the British Army do? Did they stand by them whenever the Loyalists came down from the Loyalist areas they attacked them? No. They turned their guns on us, the Nationalist people. And that was when the struggle began in 1969. Then in 1971, when they saw that the nicest people no longer were going to lie down, but were going to demand, not concessions, but what was rightly theirs, jobs, homes, and when they seen that they weren't going to get this, then they demanded their country back so that they could get their jobs and their homes. So in 1971, they fell back on their old ploy that they have used this last 60 years, namely internment. From 1971 to 1975, there were thousands, literally thousands of men and women interned. But they saw that this didn't work. So they come up with a bright idea of criminalization. The only expansion or the only growth industry in the six counties is the building of prisons. In fact, it's like a modern factory processing a man from the, from the streets into jail and keeping them there for anything up to 20 and 30 years. Uh, it begins, of course, with the special laws which allow the RUC and the British yeah. Army to arrest a man just on suspicion and hold him at one of their uh, barracks and then at a special interrogation centre. Uh, he's held under special legislation, he's interrogated under special legislation and he's then set down in front of a judge and only a judge whose history is generally a one of either being a member of the Unionist Party or a member of the old Stormont Parliament or a member of the British Army, or we had the case of McGonagall, Judge McGonagall, who was 
a sauce man in his day before he became a judge. So he then sentenced under special legislation and given long periods of time. And at the end of all that, the Brits then say there's nothing special about him and put him in the H block. That's what we call the conveyor belt system. basic demands which are no prison work, the right to wear their own clothing at all times, a letter, one letter, one visit and one parcel a week, free association among political prisoners and full remission. But was a decision taken by a group of men on remand at that time that they were not going to be criminalised and that they were going to make some form of protest against the British government's criminalisation policy. Keir Nugent was sentenced on September 1976 and when he was sentenced he was taken to Long Cash, brought to a reception area where they brought prison clothing and told him to put it on. He refused to put the prison clothing on as he was a Republican and he wasn't going to be criminalised. As the months went on there was more men kept coming on the protest. It was in April 1978 that the men, due to harassment by the prison authorities, going to the showers, going to the toilets and to slap out, which means to empty the urine and everything else that is in the pot. When the men were going on this, they were going down one at a time, on the showers, they were getting two minutes on a cold shower. After two minutes, they were dragged from the shower with the soap still on them and they were told to go back to their cells again. They were being beaten during this. 
German slapout lubricant down with the pots of urine to empty them. The screws were tripping them up and pouring the urine over them, knocking the urine, urine over them by just hitting the pots. So the man and his black came to a decision that rather than go down and suffer the beatings and harassment that the prison, prison authorities were putting on them, that they would refuse to slap out. They decided that they would use a cell as a toilet and if the orderlies came round and emptied it every day, that that would be all right. But after a couple of days, the, the orderlies had been emptying it and then they stopped emptying it and the pots were overflowing and the dirt was gathering in, in the corners. The screws started the cell searches, which meant men on the cells were coming in and lifting the pots of urine, throwing it around the men, and they were throwing the blankets on top of the excreta, which was in the corner, and tramping on them. So the men then decided that the only way that they could stop this was by throwing the excreta and the urine out the windows. But during the night, the prison officers were coming round with shovels and they were lifting it and throwing it back in on top of the men lying on the cells. So when our decision was taken by the men that to stop this, they would rub it on the outside wall off it. The Brits put it across it, it's all self-inflicted. By what I'm only after saying there, it proves that it was never self-inflicted. Everything that happened in his black was brought on by the harassment of the prison authorities. And that was it, for three years, on the blanket. That's, and what's entailed all the, all the other things, what the blanket men are going through now, all the other sufferings of wing moves, all the searches, going on visits, and the brutality which is still going on in hate's black. I've been released now eight weeks, and when I was, when I was there, brutality was still being carried out. To me, the men, the men about being self-inflicted, it, it, to me, it wasn't self-inflicted. The, the part of me not wearing prison clothing, yes, it was my decision. But I'm, I'm, I'm a, I have a principle, which is my own. I'm entitled to my own principle. And I believe that I am not a criminal. And the situation in Ireland is political. There's a war going on in Ireland. And I happen to be arrested, I'm tied into it by these soldiers raiding my home and saying that these weapons were found in my house. So I'm not going to be criminalised. The men are on the blanket today are not criminals. They say it's self-inflicted, but you can't, you can't kick yourself down over a mirror. You can't push things into your inside. You can't search your own mouth. Men are being continually beaten in hate blacks through wing moves and other harassment for to try and make them wear the prison clothes. Try and criminalise themselves. And this will not do. When I left them, they were still very determined and strong. And they'll continue their protest until they're treated as political prisoners. In 1968, a few hundred people marched down the street of Derry. The RUC looked at us and they said we were only a few hundred. And if they gave us a big enough hiding, they'd stop us before we started. And that was their first mistake. Because within four weeks of them beating us off the streets of Derry, not several hundred, 
but tens of thousands marched over that street again, and there weren't enough policemen to stop us. And they tried when thousands of people, not even as many as are here today, marched on the streets for their rights and for justice to stop us with internment. And when they lifted the men folk from our communities and threw them in long cash, they thought they had us beaten. And when they shot our people down on the street in Bloody Sunday, they thought they had us beaten. And after Bloody Sunday, the march in Newry, which was the last big demonstration until today, was the answer of the Irish people to something the British will never understand. Hundreds of years ago, when they took from us our national language, they didn't notice that the national language of the Irish people does not have a word for defeat. Because defeat is something we have never recognized, something we have never envisaged, and something that will never be inflicted upon us. When people, when people in high places and in the media try to give the impression that the demand for political status is something new in this country, when they try to tell us that the young men and the young women who fill the prisons and the hell holes of Long Cash and Armagh and Port Leisha and the British jails, they try to tell us that there is no connection between those young people and 800 years of history, that somehow they're different, that we're not the same as the people of 1916 or 1798 or 1864. Let it be remembered that in every single generation of our people, our prisoners fought for and some died for, but they won recognition of their status as political prisoners. And I have one simple message for the British government. They never learned the lessons of history. And when Robert Bradford said, let the prisoners die, nobody will care. Let me remind them. And let me also remind Mr. C.J. Hawhey, who's sitting in the Doyle in the South, and who has the power to tell the British that if they want his blood money on the border, they had better grant political status to the prisoners. Let them all take note of one thing. In 1916, a very few brave men and women walked into the general post office in Dublin. And the people of Dublin spat on them because their sons were fighting in the Great War. And the people who would serve neither King nor Kaiser were very few in this country. And the people were confused and they didn't understand what was happening. And they didn't like violence and they didn't like confusion and they didn't like politics. And they spat on the men who went into the post office. And some of them spat on those brave men when they fought and lost and were carried out of that post office. And Britain thought again that we were beaten. <laughs> and she lined them up and executed them. And from that stupid action rose the war of independence that freed 26 counties of this country. Let me say to the British government, let one prisoner die and you may well light the spark that will free the remaining six. <laughs> protest in Hits Black has been going on there for four years and it is up to people like me and Joe who has been released from Hits Black to travel around and to tell the people off the world of the true conditions in Hits Black so that they can pressurise the British government into granting the protesters their demands 
because at the moment hate's black as torture but before long it will be murder.